Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lissy Medvedev, Executive Director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at Boston College Law School. Along with my colleagues at the center, Cindy Wynn and Professor Dan Canstrom. And in conjunction with the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston at Harvard's Kennedy School and my colleagues there, Catherine Carlson, Executive Director, Polly O'Brien, Associate Director, and <laughs> Professor Jeff Liebman, welcome to the launch of the Greater Boston Debate Series. This program will be recorded and if time permits, there will be a Q&A at the end. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function. This series was designed to provide space for respectful exchanges of opinion and dialogue on issues that are vital to all of us, residents, communities, local municipalities, and state government. We begin today with qualified immunity and continue on June 23rd talking about whether public transit should be free or not and pick up again in the fall. We are honored to kick off our debate series with a moderator extraordinaire, Tiziana Deering, host of Radio Boston at WBUR and two exceptional lawyers. I have the pleasure of introducing <laughs> Tiziana and she in turn will introduce our panelists. Tiziana has been a commentator and contributor to WBUR for more than a decade and has contributed as well to a number of other regional and national news outlets. Prior to joining Radio Boston, she was a professor at Boston College's School of Social Work, where she taught social innovation and leadership, perfect topics for a longtime nonprofit executive particularly in the role of an anti-poverty advocate. She ran Boston Rising, a startup established to end generational poverty in Boston. And she has the distinction of having been the first woman president of Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of Boston. Earlier in her career, Tiziana served as executive director of the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations at Harvard, and she spent several years in management consulting. She's been on a gazillion boards and advisory boards. She's been the recipient of multiple awards. She has a master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and a bachelor's from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Tiziana Deary. Thank you for that introduction, Lissy. I always try to make a note to myself that bio sounds too long once I give it out. So it was kind of you to read that much. I am really looking forward to moderating a thoughtful and challenging conversation on the question of should qualified immunity for police be redefined. My first order of business is actually in to introduce our two panelists. So I'm going to do that right now. Ivan Espinoza Madrigal is the executive director of Lawyers for Civil Rights. Under his leadership, LCR has become a hub for litigation and advocacy for racial justice. Espinoza Madrigal has filed and won dozens of cases on a wide range of civil rights issues, including immigrants' rights and LGBT HIV equality. His work is regularly featured in publications such as the New York Times. He recently led a congressional delegation to observe and document the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Central America, including violence, poverty, and displacement inextricably intertwined with climate change. Previously, he worked at Lambda Legal, Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and Freed Frank LLP. He clerked as in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York. The National LGBT Bar Association has recognized him as one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40, and the Boston Business Journal uh, included him in its top 40 under 40 list in 2018. Uh, he's a summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and received a Juris Doctor from NYU School of Law. Yvonne, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tiziana. And I am going to point out, I am abridging these bios as well. Both of our panelists have accomplished even more than I am reading to you now. 
<laughs> Leonard Lenny Keston is one of the preeminent trial lawyers in Massachusetts. Keston has conducted over 135 jury trials in the United States District Court and the Superior Court. He's also conducted numerous public hearings before the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. He's handled appeals before the Supreme Judicial Court, the Massachusetts Court of Appeals, and the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. He is considered one of the leading defenders of police officers as he has developed extensive expertise in the area of the interpretation of the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution. Before becoming an attorney, he worked for both the Connecticut and Massachusetts Departments of Correction. He began his career as a corrections officer and counselor in a pre-release center in New Haven, Connecticut, and later became a superintendent of a similar facility in Boston. He also worked as a special education teacher in the Boston Public Schools. He was born in Poland and is a child of Holocaust survivors. He and his family moved to Israel and then the United States when he was 10 years old, and he was raised on a chicken farm in Connecticut. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Okay. My pleasure. So as we jump in, a couple of notes on ground rules and a quick definition of qualified immunity for the audience. So bear with me as I talk for about two more minutes because then you're gonna get to do all the talking, the two of you after that. Um, so I, we're gonna treat this as a friendly if competitive conversation. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna keep a clock, but I would ask you if you could to try to keep any of your responses to one to two minutes, just so that we can get a healthy back and forth going. I'll be posing questions to both of you. I'm gonna to try to make sure you both get roughly equal time. If I gotta jump in and direct traffic when you're talking to each other, I will do that. At the beginning, you're each gonna have up to five minutes to make opening statements. And I'll let you know when you've got about a minute left, et cetera, in those five minutes. And we are hoping to take some questions from the Q&A in the audience at the end. Any questions on how that's gonna work? Okay, so lastly, before your opening statements, this is a lay person's, and I stress that, definition of what we mean by qualified immunity for the audience. Qualified immunity means that public officials, including law enforcement officers, are protected from individual liability unless the official violated a clearly established constitutional right. In the beginning, it was designed to protect law enforcement officers from having to know ever-changing case law while doing their jobs. Now, at issue is the breadth of the protection that qualified immunity offers law enforcement officers, because in practice, if there's not already a precedent from a case very much like the specific circumstances of the case in question, then there really isn't a case. Now, across the country, many states are reconsidering qualified immunity laws, including Massachusetts, particularly with regard to excessive force and the impact on people of color, hence our debate today. Opponents feel that qualified immunity makes it far too easy to protect officers. Supporters say officers need to be protected from having to second guess themselves on the job. So there is a basic setup for you. Um, are you both prepared for opening statements? Okay, Lenny, I'm going to give you a chance to go first, uh, and you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is an important topic, especially on a day like today, given the anniversary of George Floyd's death. I have been uh, working uh, with law and in law enforcement uh, most of my adult life. We also uh, I participate in uh, training law enforcement officers. And the, uh, the notion that qualified immunity is a huge bar to litigation is just not true. However, could qualified immunity get a tweak? Sure, qualified immunity is created by the courts and the ball has moved with it. But the reality is this, it's a simple equation when you think about it. The constitution gives police officers, and I, we'll just not talk police officers in this debate, no guidance. It says that the force that they use should be reasonable. That's it. So if we stick with what the Constitution does, that means that every time a police officer uses force, uh, she can be sued and a jury will decide whether it's reasonable or not. Doesn't matter what it is, it'll go to a jury. The, the question always is, is what cases will we allow to go to a jury? So there's, there's other mechanisms such as summary judgment for getting, uh, getting case, frivolous cases out. But the, the, it's the courts in the United States that define what constitutional rights are. So if, if a police officer, you're training a police officer, police officer to decide, am I allowed to do this? They can't look to the constitution. It'll just say reasonable. 
So you have to look, you're always looking at judicial precedents to see what you can and can't do. When can you use, when can you use your, your weapon? Uh, when can you use now tasers? It's a new weapon. We're trying to develop rules. The rules are developed through case law. And the notion of qualified immunity is this. It's not really an immunity. What it says is this. You can't hold somebody liable for something they can't possibly know is illegal. If the, court, if the court tells us, okay, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't use deadly force only these circumstances, now they know. If there's no guidance, how can you hold somebody liable? We have statutes that are stricken for vagueness because they don't give the citizens uh, the rules. The citizens don't know what the disorderly conduct is. That always comes up, it's too vague. Well, what happens here when the rule is it has to be reasonable? And how does an officer know that? It is always up to the courts to set the rules, and that's what this doctrine applied properly should do. Should there be changes? Yes, and I will be happy to talk about it later. I think I hit the five minutes. Oh, you were under, which means more time for debate, so thanks for that. Yvonne, I'll turn it over to you now for up to five minutes as well. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you, Tiziana, for moderating. I want to thank uh, my brother uh, Lenny for joining us for this debate. And I want to thank Lissy and the Rappaport Center at BC Law for hosting us. This is an important conversation and I look forward to future uh, conversations of this nature in person as the pandemic continues to unfold. Turning to the issue, uh, there are a couple of things that, uh, that my colleague has said that I completely agree with. Uh, it is not an impediment to suing but it is most certainly an impediment for winning. It is an impediment for justice. And this often is really tied along racial lines. Um, and I also agree with my colleague that as a doctrine created by the court, the ball has moved, but I would say not nearly enough. And so what I really want to start with is by, is by taking a step back and looking at what we're talking about here, which is public safety. We are talking about sworn officers who have uh, sworn an oath that they will protect and serve. This is a public safety matter. And I would go one step further. In talking about reasonable reforms, in talking about ideally significant reforms, uh, or elimination of the doctrine altogether. What we're really talking about is protecting police, which is really important here. Protecting police from the corrosive effect of having the public believe that there is no accountability, of the corrosive effect of having the public believe that there's no transparency, and of the corrosive effect of having tension with community, particularly with communities in Congo. We would not have all unanimously across the country applauded so enthusiastically and vigorously a Derek Chavin's conviction in connection with George Floyd's murder if those type of incidents and scenarios were more often what we saw happening. But Chavin's conviction is the exception, not the rule. And, and I wanna be very clear about this as a legal organization that both sues police and protects officers because we do both. It is really important for us to make sure that we are in tune to the difficult nature of this job. Police need breathing room to make reasonable decisions, split second decisions, especially if these are open legal questions in the matter that Lenny described. But let's be very clear. We are not chipping away at a critical protection from law enforcement. We are actually talking about making sure that police have more legitimacy and there are already instruments at play like the Fourth Amendment, the 14th Amendment that will allow for frivolous lawsuits to be addressed in the matter that my colleague just described. And so why the reform? The reform is needed to bring this doctrine into the 21st century. The reform is needed because for George Floyd. The reform is needed because the ball hasn't moved far enough. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I think what I'm going to do here is give you each a, a, just a, a chance to respond to comments from each other, and then I'm going to launch into questions. So Lenny, you know, minute or two, anything you want to respond to from Yvonne there, and Yvonne, I'll come back to you for the same. I agree with almost everything he says. 
that uh, about the reforms and all that is needed. But we're here to talk about qualified immunity. I'd be happy to talk about other kinds of reforms which are needed. However, we're here to talk about qualified immunity. And uh, I do not believe that qualified immunity has anything to do with almost everything that he's talking about. Derek Chauvin was never gonna get qualified immunity. Uh, a qualified immunity is not, I have seen no evidence or suggestion that's applied along racial lines. It's a somewhat esoteric judicial doctrine and what, it's, what it was supposed to do when they created it was really set rules uh, for the police officers going forward in places where they weren't. And I don't think anyone can quarrel with that notion. And also I say that the tort, this is about tort, this is about lawsuits for money, that uh, the tort system is not well designed to, deal, to change, to create change. That's what we're talking about. If we, if we allow people to collect more money, then that will change police departments. Qualified immunity uh, will not do that. It will not do that at all. Will not achieve what we want to achieve. And it, as I say, it, is, it comes down to fairness of everybody knowing the rules. And that's what the doctrine is for. Sorry, unmute. Yvonne, go ahead and respond. I, I disagree that qualified immunity has nothing to do with these issues. I think it's at the very heart of, of the problem. It's at the very heart of the issues that we're talking about. And I also disagree with the assessment and shaving. I think in a different world, without that nine minute video, without the public outrage and attention that has, that has rightfully been assigned to George Floyd's case, Chavin would have walked away scot-free. And that's because courts through qualified immunity have let cops get away with murder. And that's not to say that every police officer is bad. Absolutely not. We're talking about a handful of bad apples like Chavin. But each day, day in and out in courts across the country, officers like Chapin get away with murder. And that is why the issue that we're talking about is so critical to whether we call it legal or policy considerations or community considerations, they're all intertwined. And so, and so I, I do wanna give some pushback to what Lenny's talking about with respect to that, because I live in a world where I see the law operating in situations uh, maybe not to the same degree as, as, as George Floyd's situation, but I see many situations that should be the subject of judicial redress that fail to be able to be redressed because of qualified immunity. And we have examples of that right here in the Commonwealth. So Lenny, what about Yvonne's point that stipulated you, you, can, you can sue um, under qualified immunity as it stands, a law enforcement officer, but you can't win. That's simply, uh, I don't know, when people say this, it's beyond me. I have handled, I've been involved in hundreds if not thousands of cases against police officers and the concept that you can't win. Yes, if it's a bit, we have settled a lot of cases because we made the assessment that, that a jury will find that the officer did something wrong. And also here, what, what we're mixing up is civil and criminal liability. Chauvin, yeah, I don't want to. We are exclusively yeah. talking civil in this conversation. Yeah. So when we're talking, we're talking about the police officer mm -hmm. get away with murder. I mean, don't get prosecuted. This is qualified immunity has nothing to do with that. There's not a doctrine in the criminal law. It's only in the civil tort law that it's a doctrine. And absolutely not. Officers do not get away with murder. I have, I have read a lot of these uh, articles about the problems with qualified immunity, they point to certain cases and I've read them and it's not a real problem. That it's, the qualified immunity is a major problem. Officers do not get away with behaving badly in, in this Commonwealth, uh, certainly not in this Commonwealth because of qualified immunity. Ivan, go ahead. Uh, one, one, one thing that I want to highlight there is that the issue of of civil liability of, uh, and, and Lenny alluded to this, the case is settled. The case is settled because over 90% of litigation settles. And so, and so cases are bound to settle. But does that mean that people are getting a fair day in court? I don't necessarily think so. And, and the other point, especially to the point of civil liability, 
qualified immunity was made to protect the officers, as you explained uh, in very succinct terms, uh, Tatiana, at the very beginning, from, from individual, from personal liability. And if you look at an assessment of the cases across the country, 99.9% .9 of cases uh, where this type of civil liability is being raised, the settlement is paid by the agencies. And this, especially in Massachusetts, where study after study has found that an officer is more likely to be struck by lightning than to have to contribute towards some type of, of civil um, of damages action. So Ivan, why not provide financial protections to a public servant? <clears throat> why should- Oh, I don't disagree. Servant, why should a public servant be personally financially liable? I don't disagree that some level of protection is important. And this is the distinction between absolute versus qualified immunity. We're, we, this is supposed to be qualified immunity, not absolute immunity. And far too often what we are seeing are significant barriers, the burden on a plaintiff to be able to succeed, that bar is absolutely high. And so it, it's, it's not about whether some type of immunity should exist. I readily uh, would accept a world in which some type of, of qualified immunity ex ex exists, but this is not what we're seeing. It's hard to see what's qualified about the immunity as it works right now. It's really operating as an absolute shield where even unreasonable conduct goes unaddressed. So Lenny, um, when I was learning about this last summer, I had a conversation on air on, on Radio Boston with retired federal judge Nancy Gertner, um, kind of walking us through and explaining to us uh, what qualified immunity is, uh, what the, the complaints about it are, et cetera. And, and one of the things that, she talked about was the fact that you cannot establish new case law. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk like a lay person because I am. You cannot establish new case law. As I said in the summary at the beginning, in order to, to get a, a conviction, a civil conviction, the circumstances of the case essentially have to have already been codified by some other case. Um, what of that idea that as it has evolved, essentially the ability to create new case law so that we can apply what you say is, you know, reasonable judgment by a law enforcement officer um, is essentially completely stagnant. There's no new, new case law that can be developed. Well, by the way, Nancy Gertner is a terrific human being and a great jurist. I'm a major fan. Um, well, that's not true, but let me just explain to you the, the thing that qualified immunity, one of the major problems that qualified immunity needs to be changed on. When it started out, the court first had to decide if you, first of all, they start with this premise. If you believe the plaintiff, because there's always two sides, right? The, the plaintiff says, he punched me for no reason. The police officer said he tried to kill me and I had to defend myself. So what the court looks at is if we believe the plaintiff, does the plaintiff have a case? So number one is, the courts would have to decide for qualified immunity purposes. Um, and I've, I can point to three decisions that I was involved in, which really elucidated, but, uh, but elucidate, not bad for a kid from Poland, don't you think? So uh, uh, you look at the conduct as, as if you believe the plaintiff, could a jury find that that was a, a violation of the constitution? If, uh, that's, the, that's the thing they look at. If they could, then the case moves on. If they say it couldn't, the case ends, no qualified immunity. Then they would have, they have to move to prong two. If we say, yes, we think a jury could find that this was a violation. Number two is, would a reasonable officer at the time it happened have been on notice that this could be a violation? That's what qualified immunity is. And if they say no, because at that time it wasn't, but they've decided that, it, going forward, it will be because we're deciding it is a violation in this circumstance. What happened with the Saucier case is that the Supreme Court said they don't have to do that. The first prong, they can just say, we're not gonna decide whether or not this violates. We're just gonna give them qualified immunity. Nobody likes that, trust me, nobody likes it. The police don't like it because you don't have rules still. It says, well, maybe yes, maybe no, we don't know. So this plaintiff is not gonna have a case but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna tell anyone whether the next plaintiff 
has a case. I mean, the case, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Ivan with the, the taser case, the gray case versus Athol, but it's a, can you use a taser on a, somebody who you know is mentally ill? It was an open question. The court did it right. The court said, we now say we don't think you can, but because it wasn't settled at the time, this one officer will not be found liable. But they need to set the rules. And what's been happening is by not forcing them to do prong one, which and they more and more default to prong two. And trust me, the, the plaintiffs don't like it. The police don't like it. Nobody likes that default. They should have to decide whether or not going forward and set the rules as you asked. All right. So let's let Yvonne respond to that. There was a lot in there. I love I'll pick up right where, where Lenny ended. I love the fact that you brought up the Gray case. And, and, I, and, and I think it's, it, that case actually makes my point very clear. Who in their right mind, except for judges trying to twist themselves into a pretzel to get police officers off the hook, would say that using a taser on a person experiencing mental health issues Miss Gray had bipolar disorder, that that was appropriate under those circumstances. It's, it's alarming, the facts in that case. And yet, the court used it as an opportunity to let the person get away. It, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Appalling set of facts, alarming set of facts that raise goosebumps in my house and in suburban homes and yet, because these cases often go under the radar, then it's supposed to be acceptable that the outcome in gray is that that person, it was just not clearly established law. Well, if you ask me, it is unreasonable to use a taser in those circumstances or in many other circumstances. And so, and so I think that's here what, what, what is the tension in this conversation is that I think having that wide opening in the jurisprudence is corrosive. It creates illegitimacy in policing. It raises the type of legitimate concerns that then make people go out there and say, abolish and defund. That's not the camp I'm in at all. You're never gonna hear that from me, but it is, it is those cases like Gray that trigger that type of public response. The fact that qualified immunity is, is still something that we're debating about and that we're using gray as an example of how this works is actually precisely why the doctrine is doomed and why law enforcement needs to modernize in order to make sure that the doctrine keeps up with the needs of the present. Gray was wrongly decided. All right, and, Lenny, I'm gonna give you- Judge Gertner is right. So Lenny, I'm gonna give you a minute to respond there. And then Yvonne, I, I wanna come back and, and hear what your proposal is for modernization so that we can go back and forth on that a little bit. So Lenny, go ahead. Gray, the Gray Court looked at other decisions of other courts and other courts had found the use of tasers to be constitutional, not qualified immunity, but constitutional under these circumstances. And one thing I wanna point out is it is so easy for us to say that they shouldn't use that kind of, or that. If you don't use non less than lethal force, these things are called. Then I'm sorry, gonna, Lenny, I'm just gonna, gonna stop you for a second. Cause I, I, if I'm having trouble following you, then I think some in the audience are, you, you just said, the court said, don't do that. Can, can you be a little more ex explicit in what yes. you were just, thanks. Yes, the, that question of these facts, whether taser was appropriate, the court looked back at other decisions of other courts in the past and said, some courts have said yes, some courts have said no. Now, Yvonne says in my book, that's never constitutional, but that's not what other courts said. And they didn't say qualified immunity. Other courts said, it's just constitutional, it's okay. So Officer Gray, had he been a constitutional scholar, would have known at the time that some courts have said, I can, some courts have said, I can't. And that's what this court said. From now on, no. But at the time you did it, other courts had authorized it. So he's saying the officer got away with something. Well, how did he get away with anything when there was no rule? There was nothing that said you can never do it. All right, so I'm gonna take us off. The, I'm gonna take us off the gray case now because I think now we're, 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 we're treading into territory where some of our lawyer listeners probably or, or watchers probably are with us, but we might be 
stepping away from the conversation for the largest audience. Yvonne, you, you said modernize it, bring it into the 21st century. So let's work with that for a minute. Let, put on the table what you mean. And then Lenny, let's compare and contrast that to your comment at the beginning that there are some tweaks that need to be done. I think there are already some models out there. For example, in Colorado, where, uh, where, where now qualified immunity cannot be raised um, as a defense uh, um, at the, in state courts, there's also a cap to the damages that apply. It's, uh, I believe, 25,000. And so that seems like not necessarily where I would land on this, but, but my point is there are models of reform that have worked not just in Colorado, but in Connecticut and New Mexico, where we allow officers flexibility in being able to do the job that they do. And I fully agree with what Lenny was saying. And I, I was the first one to put that on the table. Officers are making split second decisions is the way I put it at the very beginning of this uh, discussion. I want them to have breathing room to make reasonable but mistaken judgments, just like any professional should. The problem is that it is much harder to, to go after uh, an officer who has committed wrongdoing than it is to go after a doctor. I mean, it's just, that's the world we live in. And so for me, I, I'm not necessarily saying that there's a silver bullet or that this is necessarily the path that we have to follow but there are models of reform that are available out there. In Massachusetts right now, we have a commission studying the issue. It's a bipartisan commission, uh, appointees from the Baker administration, appointees uh, from, from other uh, branches of the state legislature. Um, I sit on it as a representative of the NAACP, and we're studying the issue to see what makes sense in Massachusetts based on based on the facts and based on what, where people are right now. And Lenny, have you seen reform models? Uh, Yvonne just gave us some examples. Have you seen reform models that you, you said at the beginning, yes, tweaks. So what tweaks have you seen elsewhere that you think would be appropriate in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Well, first, so we're clear, the, the, the state law, the states that are addressing this, addressing this will not do much because they can't uh, control federal law. And qualified immunity applplies to 1983, which is a federal statute, which is a statute that 99% of plaintiffs sue under, and no, the states can't affect it. So that commission that, that uh, Ivana is on, which I was hoping to testify before, uh, is uh, uh, they can't change federal law. And the Colorado model is making officers individually liable, making them pay. If the federal law, uh, so what, what are the tweaks? Number one is what I said before, which is we should force, uh, the courts should be mandated to make the initial decision whether or not what the rules are for this set of circumstances. Uh, the use of a taser, the use of a canine, I, I handled that case, which went up, that was decided, you know, when can you use a canine to apprehend a suspect? Can you do it on a fleeing misdemeanant or is that to be a felon? You have, so they set out the rule. So people know, and we could train to it. So that needs to be done because right now, most of them are not this, making that decision and then it doesn't help anybody. That needs to be changed. Uh, I would be okay with them changing the second prong, make, making it a little easier. Right now, some courts have said it has to be, be beyond dispute that the law was established. I think that's too high a burden. You know, it doesn't have to be beyond dispute. It, it, it should be a, that a reasonable police officer would understand. But the, see, the, it's, it's a question of setting the rules. Doctors can, can't be sued unless somebody says that what they did was negligent. They can't just be sued. They also have a threshold to get there. They can get a case thrown out. All of us can. And what this doctrine does is essentially the same thing as to say, you have to have a rule that you're broke. Because as I say, you can't just say you've violated the Fourth Amendment because what you did was unreasonable. That's no guidance at all. All right, so let me let me direct a couple of questions at, at each of you now um, for a minute. Um, Yvonne, uh, you 
one of the things that is interesting both in the framing of this debate and in the way the two of you are being present in it is we're not having a, a, a conversation about fully eliminating qualified immunity. Um, I, I do though want to bring up concerns that we have learned, heard from law enforcement officers about the chilling effect that it would have to change or substantially change or eliminate qualified immunity protections. And, and one of the things uh, last summer that really caught my attention was a statement um, made uh, by the Worcester Police Union. So last summer they wrote in a statement, quote, and this was about the end of qualified immunity, quote, with the end of qualified immunity, immunity, an officer is more protected under the law by doing absolutely nothing to help you, end quote. Now that was an extreme statement in response to uh, the idea of a complete elimination of qualified immunity, but what of the practical chilling effect on people who are in fact making split second decisions, which you acknowledged, you know, in, in, in fog circumstances, often under duress, do you worry about a structural disincentive to performing on the job? I don't, and, and I'll, um, and, and, and before I answer that, I just wanna go back really quickly to piggyback of something that Lenny said, uh, and, and, I, and I agree with much of what Lenny said, but what I wanted to emphasize is one potential reform is not to necessarily um, uh, expand the universe of the ability to sue officers in their individual capacity. Let's give victims the ability to sue the departments, greater ability to sue the departments. And so trying to shift there uh, in terms of liability. But, but to answer your question, I, do not fear the chilling effect that you're talking about for a couple of reasons. And we've already seen this on the ground. One is, do you remember much conversation around the use of body cameras? Many officers were reluctant. Many officers were saying, this is just going to be an impediment in me being able to do my work. And uh, maybe some of the things that I'm going to do are not going to come across in the way that it actually happens on the street. And so th this is going to be used against me in some way. If you talk to most officers now, they actually welcome the body cameras for multiple reasons. One is it protects them from frivolous allegations. It's like you have the recording to show that that's not the way that the situation transpired. And so what we've seen is that modernizations in the policing arena have actually been a win-win across the board, a win for officers to keep them safe and a win for the communities they serve. And I think with this, we have another win-win scenario. Even though the conversation is highly polarized, I actually think we have a win-win scenario. If we talk about uh, reforms that would allow for, for more protection for the community uh, and for really the elimination of bad apples, because that's what we're talking about here, the elimination of bad apples or liability for bad apples, um, sticking to the civil side of the conversation, um, I, I really think that that makes the whole much more uh, transparent, accountable, and it allows for the community to see that the department is actually responsive. And so for me, I, I, I think quite the opposite. I think instead of a chilling effect, this is actually going to help create a tremendous bridge between communities that often do not see themselves identified in policing practices and that, not to lose the issue of race, often falls along racial lines. So picking up from there, Lenny, the question that I have for you, you know, we, we are not discussing whether or not uh, qualified immunity for police should be redefined at any time, right? We're discussing it in this moment. You're the one that pointed out at the beginning of our conversation that today is the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. Um, you talked a minute ago about the fact that there, there's, a, there's a federal level to this law that has, again, in a layperson's term, sort of dominance or supersedes and is the controlling environment and controlling factor. Uh, last year, uh, when police reform conversations were at, at great heat in the summer of 2020, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley said in a statement, quote, let me be clear, qualified immunity is a barrier to accountability and healing, and we must dismantle it, end quote. We are seeing in Massachusetts at the federal level in, in states all across the country, push back on qualified immunity as it stands. You've 
you've said you're open to some tweaks, but do you, can you address the profound distrust of the moment that we are in and the harm it could do for people to feel that they cannot get satisfaction? And you must know that there, that, that is a, a common sense, that you cannot get satisfaction in civil court uh, when suing a police officer for a constitutional violation. You know what the, the remedy for that is? Simple education. I have had the opportunity to talk to some folks in the legislature about the facts on the ground. That is simply not true. I mean, I have, we have handled tons of cases against police officers. And the notion that qualified immunity is some big bugaboo, it's only about money. It's about money. If you want systemic change, if you want the police to change and be more accessible, if you want that, then change the, 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 the disciplinary structure where, where police chiefs have a really hard time. Towns have removing officers for cause because they get put back by arbitrators. Happens all the time. So, so but the, th the thought that qualified will do it, all that'll mean is the taxpayers will pay more. And what is that gonna do? It's not gonna cause transparency. It's the civil suit, which only seeks money. Yvonne, go ahead. Money sometimes is the only thing like that a family like George Floyd's has. It really is the only thing. And it's sad. It's sad that a family would be in that situation where we're talking about money. And so I'm not as dismissive about the money component, but I certainly do agree that other components that Lenny uh, is racing are critical here. Um, and some of them were addressed with the legislative changes that were implemented by the Commonwealth last summer. For example, the scenario that Lenny just, just uh, articulated, which is a common one, where a bad apple is being dismissed and then gets reinstated, not by the police. The police chief wants to get rid of this person. And then the police chief his hands are tied in the way that Lenny just explained. We, we've, we've seen this time and time again. And so we were one of, of just a handful of states that did not have a police decertification process to make sure that those people cannot all of a sudden just pick up and leave the Boston Police Department, but just go across the river and work in the Cambridge Police Department or go across the state and pick up and work at another police department. And so those reforms are critical. And, and Lenny has a point also on training, critical points. And that's why when we uh, work with police and victims, we always talk not just about damages, not just about money, but about training and about disciplinary measures and, and a host, a constellation of factors, some of which Lenny alluded to. And so these pieces coexist. I fully agree with that. But I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss the fact that uh, that the damages itself, that the money is a significant part of the remedy. And it's a part of the remedy to, to just start the process of healing for families. And frankly, also because money talks. And if you're going to hit a defendant, particularly a repeat bad player, uh, it, it is the money that talks. And so I know that that sounds crass, but I think we need to be realistic here about what are the community dynamics, and what are the what, what are some of the optics that Lenny's talking about, which which I I appreciate that he's putting in the table, and I don't want to shy away from those. So, um, Lenny, if not money, and if we're not talking, we're we're staying in the civil realm. If not money, what are appropriate painful consequences? Number one is the money is paid by the taxpayers. I think it's uh, the last study I read, 99.2% of all funds ever paid for police cases are paid by the taxpayers, not by the officers. And so Yvonne, if that's the case, then why is money the issue when the, the individual officer is still not experiencing an accountability consequence from that so, money? So two points to that. One is, then why the hell are officers up in arms about the elimination of the doctrine if they're not the ones paying out of pocket? And second of all, if the, if the departments are the ones paying, then taxpayers should really be asking, what are you doing? What are you allowing? How are you training? 
I mean, that this is one basic thing. And I think it's one positive thing to come out of the racial justice reckoning nationally is that there's a lot more attention to hold up. So what is this line item here dedicated to litigation that a police department has? And so what are measures that could be taken to make sure that you are not as taxpayers uh, fronting the bill for, uh, for, for practices that are reprehensible? Wow. Let, please, that's it. Can I brief? Can you give me a little time? Yep. yep, that's you. Yes, with the police officers, yes. I've been going around the state telling them all, it's not gonna do anything financially to you. The Colorado model does, not in Massachusetts. Because in Massachusetts, we have indemnification statutes and we have insurance. So that's why 99.2%, all this, it's, it's all being paid for by the taxpayers. That exists and, and the outrage or whatever exists already. This is the job of the, of the selectman, the mayor, whatever. If there's a police officer who's causing problems, they act and it's not the money. See, the, 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 there's this thought that the money will solve the problem if we, if, we, if we award money. And money is not the way to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem is, you know, look, we have this, this accreditation process. I can tell you this, the officers are all just worried about how it's gonna play out because they don't know. I understand that, not necessarily a bad thing, but we have to, because there they are, it's split second decisions. I had a three week trial in a case in which the officer had 0.6 of seconds to decide whether to shoot or not. And, and they deserve, as I go back to with the whole notion, it's not really, they deserve to know the rules is all I say. But, me, but the money is not gonna solve this, the problem that Yvonne is talking about. So I'm going to just to so everybody knows what's going on. I'm going to take two or three more minutes because I think we've only got a couple of questions in the Q&A section there. So I'm going to take two or three more minutes with the two of you, and then we'll field one or two questions from the audience. Yvonne, I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm hesitating to ask the question because I might be opening a bigger can of worms than we can handle in two or three minutes. So let's do it this way. Let's do lightning round. Uh, Yvonne first, then Lenny. Yvonne, discuss the role of police unions in this conversation. Okay, now you're really opening up a can of words. Lightning round, baby. <laughs> That's it. Lightning um, round. I, I don't think unions are an impediment to this. Um, uh, I, I think there are, they are a due diligence uh, point that we need to make sure that everybody's on board, but I don't see unions uh, or um, or fraternal organizations or orders as uh, as a barrier to this. Lenny, do you agree? I do. I, I, as I say, it's a matter of not just to the unions, to legislators, to everybody is, is educating them on, we're talking about qualified immunity, what it is and what it might accomplish. If we're just talking about that, it's a question of education. 99.99% .99 people that have weighed in on this issue don't understand it in the slightest and did not understand the beginning and think that this, it, it, it's, it's that, but it's not. So it's education and unions. I've worked with them when things are explained, they, they, they get it. They wanna protect their members' lives. All right, thank you to the both of you. We are not done, but I am gonna take a break and check in with Katherine Carlson to see if there are any questions from the audience that we would like to pose to our panelists. Thank you so much, Tiziana. We do have a couple questions coming in. And as a reminder, anyone out there in the audience, please submit questions via the Q&A. Um, firstly, uh, this is relevant right now. What are, what are the panelists' thoughts on the George Floyd bill and the changes that Senator Tim Scott is recommending specifically around qualified immunity? Lenny, do you want to grab that first? And then Yvonne, I'm just going to go back and forth on who answers first. Lenny, go ahead. Well, I'm not all completely familiar. I do know that one of the things they're talking about is uh, making it so that the uh, cities and towns are always liable if an officer does something. Because right now there's a, it's a two-step process. And uh, I get that. I think it, I mean, the, the, the larger question is well, what is it gonna cost everyone right now? What is it gonna cost taxpayers? What will the change be? I would like to have some, some you know, we all would like to have time to study that. How bad could that be? Uh, but, uh, uh, but I know that uh, Tim Scott does not want to eliminate qualified immunity. Yvonne. 
I generally agree with Lenny. Um, I think it is a good idea to give victims the ability to go after police departments themselves and then that way eliminate the pressure on individual officers um, so that they can do their job, as we've been talking about, um, and hold on the departments accountable directly for failure to train, for failure to provide uh, appropriate protocols and standards. Uh, but much like Lenny, uh, the bill is still a work in progress with a number of different amendments being proposed. Um, and so it's still a matter, it's, it's still in flux. It's difficult to say I'm fully in favor or against, uh, but I think any progress in this arena is welcome. Catherine, what's right. next? Say, oh, I'm sorry, Lenny, say that again. We negotiated as we speak. Yeah. Catherine, go ahead. I guess the, the, there's a follow up to that, which is just how would that necessarily work? Um, or do you see that working in terms of moving the responsibility even under qualified immunity to police departments rather than the individual? Yvonne? You know, and we, we, we talked a little bit about this, but, but I didn't really provide a meaningful response uh, before because of timing. But, but now that the issue is pressed on, I, I do think there is an, there's an aspect of individual accountability that is important. And I want to put that out there for the record. If we are talking about somebody who is deliberately and intentionally doing something bad, then they should be held liable individually. But I also think, as we've been talking about, that the department itself uh, needs to be able to provide the accountability, the training, the protocols, the procedures, all of that needs to come directly from the department. So I don't want to eliminate individuals from the equation totally, especially when we do have these outliers. Uh, but, but I do think that shifting some of the responsibility to police departments is going to be critical here. Lenny, what would you add? Got to understand another thing, and this is, I guess, it's a bit, an hour is too short. Uh, right now, there is a mechanism. If, if a police officer does something deliberately and maliciously, that officer is liable for punitive damages, which he has, he or she has to pay. There's a real, and this is something we train on too: is understand something. If you do something really bad, and the, the jury says it's so bad, we're going to work, we're going to punish you. Ain't nobody going to pay that. Now it's your house, and that deterrent works. Catherine, next. Oh, I, Yvonne, go ahead. It's rare. I mean, the instances where something like that is triggered, it's, it's even more remote in instances where qualified immunity is able to be, um, uh, that you could pierce through that shield. I mean, it's just, so Yvonne, uh, are we need you to be saying, practical. Are you saying if that was a, <laughs> how do I say this? Yes, that would be deterring but except for the fact that it almost never happens, is that what you're saying? And Lenny, Correct. what's your response to that? We put lay people in the jury box, people like Yvonne and me, lay people who make this decision. So it, you see, it's rare. Yeah, because rarely do police officers do this. But wait, doesn't it have to make it to the jury box first? And isn't that part of the challenge to uh, the doctrine, the way it currently is applied, that it well, doesn't now, ever make now it. We're, now we're circling back. The Supreme Court has said, if the conduct is so egregious, qualified immunity doesn't apply. So it doesn't apply to cases like we're suggesting, where somebody does something really horrible and there's qualified immunity. Derek Chauvin would never get qualified immunity in a civil case, never. Okay, and Yvonne, anything to add to that before we try to grab one more question from Catherine? I think even the example that we were discussing before about the great case in AFOL shows that uh, qualified immunity has been triggered, even in instances that many of us would consider. Well, no, I did it. I brought the great case back into it. Not <laughs> my intention. Sorry, folks. All right, let's try to get one more question from Catherine here. Catherine, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry to everyone whose questions are here and, and we may not get to them, but um, in, in this question is actually was put into the chat, but Yvonne and Lenny, um, there there are models out there. Do you believe, or maybe it is, where is the political will to replicate any models here? And Yvonne, is specifically to you, if there is a cap on the civil um, amounts, what should it be, um, and should it vary based on offense? Okay, okay, so let, let's do this. Let's ask Lenny the political will question first, and then Yvonne, I'll give you a chance to answer the caps question. I know it's not both sides on both of those, but we're running low on time and we'll, we'll do it that way. So Lenny, 
it, do you perceive political will to enact some level of reform, for example, comparable to you guys brought up Colorado uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Oh, in Massachusetts? Well, Yvonne Rebus does to quit, he's sitting on the panel. Yes, there's certainly political will. And I, I think so, something will happen. I think that the country, the country is demanding that something happens. Whether, whether it happens to qualified immunity, I suppose it will because people keep bringing it up as this bugaboo, which it isn't. But yes, there is political will to create, to create positive change in America. Uh, Ivan. I generally uh, agree that, um, that there's some political will, but I don't know how far it will go. And about the caps, similarly, 25K was the cap and damages in Colorado. That already presents a model right there. I'm not saying that the amount should be higher or lower than that, but I think that is a place to start. And, and I just really quickly want to focus on one thing. We shouldn't only be talking about being punitive. We should also be talking about opportunities for healing. And you mentioned this, Tatiana, um, opportunities for healing. And so I just want to put that out there because as much as we need to talk about reform, we also need to be talking about building bridges and, and really um, not demonizing officers, but not demonizing also uh, attempts at reform and, and helping to bridge those. Lenny, you had such a strong re visual response to that or visible response. Let me give you a chance to add on. Without question, I, 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 you know, the, the, the restor there's restorative justice, which is spreading through to the court about having people on both sides get together and understand each other. I'm a huge proponent of that. People should heal. The police are not their enemy. But if they feel beleaguered, right now they feel beleaguered. Most police officers feel beleaguered. Everybody hates them. And uh, that's what they're upset about. And likewise, you know, if people would understand and talk more, it's always the best thing that people could do. And I think bringing people together is a worthwhile goal that we should all work for. And I'm happy to work with Yvonne. We should all work towards it. It's, it's, the, way, it's the way forward. It has to be. We can't be on different camps shooting at each other. So Catherine, I know there are additional questions, but the radio host in me recognizes we have less than two minutes left and I know better than dive into another one. So in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to you to close us out, but I did just wanna take a minute to also personally thank both Lenny and Yvonne for engaging deeply and thoughtfully. I learned a great deal from you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this ride with you and thank you for uh, participating in the conversation today. I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Tiziana, and especially Lenny and Yvonne uh, for these compelling arguments um, on both sides. We so appreciate uh, the three of you joining us for this inaugural debate in our Greater Boston Debate Series. Again, thank you to my colleagues at the Rappaport Center um, at Boston College and from us here at the Rappaport Institute at Harvard University. Uh, as someone in the, in the chat right now just said, I would love to see this panel and topic again with more time. So Lenny, Yvonne, and Tiziana will try to book some more time for you. I think we could probably spend a day getting into this. So we'll see if we can uh, get a room when we're back in person in the fall. But until then, um, our second debate in the series is on June 23rd. And the question uh, in front of us will be, can and should public transit be free? Uh, so I hope you'll join us then. And, and we're going to take a break before we take on uh, the really easy topic of rent control in the fall. So uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the series with all of you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All. Thank you, Lenny. Take care, everybody.